Welcome back everyone to part two of our look at the brand new oversimplified Punic Wars. If you did not see part one of my reaction, there's a link in the description that will take you back to that. Before we dive into this today, I do want to address something real quick because it seems to be a frequent topic of conversation. Uh, a lot of times when these new videos come out because they're highly viewed, you know, 100,000 views on my reaction in the first 24 hours. And I occasionally get the comments from people saying that I'm ripping off oversimplified and I'm taking advantage of their new video. Listen, not only for myself, but for everybody else who's doing these reaction videos, oversimplified's getting all of that money. They claim all of the content as their copyright. So the ads that run on this video today, the money's going to Oversimplified. Last year, just my reactions alone made Oversimplified, I'm guessing, about $60,000. So uh, there, the only thing I'm gaining from this is I'm learning, and I'm probably gaining some new subscribers who are discovering the channel this way. So with that in mind, if you do want to support this channel, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Number one, first and foremost, please subscribe uh, and check out some of my other content. Uh, but also consider, uh, there's a link in the description to Patreon, and you can support this channel that way. So if you want to support what I'm doing, and I don't just do reactions, I've got a lot of other content too. So if you're new to the channel, please stick around, check out some of the other content that I have, historic site videos, I've got some original content as well. Um, so please check that stuff out. So yeah, uh, totally support what Oversimplified does, and I'm glad that they are getting what they deserve for the work that they've done. This reaction is just my way of kind of using the tool that they have provided and uh, just trying to add to it a little bit, but I'm not making any money off of it. So anyway, let's go ahead and dive into part two. After the gigantic battle at Cape Ecnomis, the Romans were now free to land on African soil and so, they did. The Carthaginians chose to focus on defending the city of Carthage itself. So the Romans immediately took the city of Aspis and were then free to raid and plunder the countryside. They took over 20,000 slaves and a ton of booty. But then, some orders arrived from the Senate. Send home the booty. Oh, but I want to stay. No, Steve, mm -hmm. not you. They mean the treasure. Well... We are not watching any more of this film. <laughs> so the other consul left with the booty, leaving Regulus and his forces on their own. And they began advancing towards Carthage. Along the way, according to the ancient writer Livy, they encountered a literal dragon. Now Livy was a Roman historian, so his account may be slightly exaggerated. But this, I believe. So uh, we talked about this yesterday. I'm going to back up for a second here. Uh, sources need to be considered in all these cases. I mentioned it before. Who's the source? What side are they on? What biases do they have? How close to the actual events are they writing? You know, if they're writing about an event that happened 300 years earlier and they're just getting information that's been passed down, it may not be accurate. But I'm really curious about the dragon thing, so I think we need to dive into this a little bit deeper. So here's the first thing we need to consider with this. The oldest source that we have for these events that are being written about comes secondhand as a fragment fragment from Aulus Gellius, who copied the version of Quintus Aulus Tubero. Tubero was writing in the late 1st century BC. So uh, we're talking about well over a hundred years after these events. While Gellius's Attic Knights was assembled in the second century AD, so now we're talking three, 350 years after these events. Now here's what Tubero writes. The consul Attalus Regulus, when encamped at the Bagratus River in Africa, fought a stubborn and fierce battle with a single serpent of extraordinary size, which had its lair in that region, that in a might struggle with the entire army, the reptile was attacked for a long time with hurling engines and catapults, and that when it was finally killed, its skin, 120 feet long, was sent to Rome. So there you have it. Um, now, I will say this. This is hardly the only reference we have to giant reptiles, dinosaurs, you might say. Uh, there are our 20th century accounts that come from places like the Congo in Africa, where you have missionaries talking to uh, natives in that region who are describing things deep in the jungle that can only be described as dinosaurs. Uh, so is there truth to some of this stuff? 
my experience with history is that where there's smoke, there's some kind of fire, even if the smoke doesn't really accurately describe the fire. I think they probably fought something. I think there's some truth to this. What it exactly was, and it, whether it was blown out of proportion, how strong and how powerful and how much might it took to take it down is another thing. Interesting story, though, it really is. And I'll actually, if I remember to, I'll throw a link in the description to this account that I'm reading so you can study more of this on your own. His account may be slightly exaggerated, but this... So I want to actually back up and read what it says down at the bottom here. Now, Livy was a Roman historian, so his account may be slightly exaggerated. It's also possibly a translation issue. Perhaps the Bagratus dragon was just a really big snake, which is what it kind of sounds like. Then again, maybe it never happened at all. A lot of ancient history is disputed like that. But hey, since you took the time to pause the video and read this, I want to let you know you're real swell, and I'm sorry I told you to shut up. <laughs> okay, awesome. But this, I believe. As the Romans continued to plunder, the Carthaginian people flooded into the city. Now, not only was it in a major panic, but it was so crowded, the people began to starve. And that's the problem. You get all the civilians inside the city, now you don't have enough supplies for your army. Uh, and now there's a lot greater chance of disease spreading, which are the two big factors in sieges. Disease and starvation. Don't panic, everyone! Look, I know I'll you're all starving, again. but I still have food for me. So, you know, it's not all bad. Whoa! You're wasting your tomatoes! And you idiots wonder why you're starving? Oh well, it's just more food for me! <laughs> Things weren't looking good for Carthage. They had to do something to stop the Romans rampaging throughout their land. So they decided, finally, it was time to put an end to it. They headed out and set up on rough hilly terrain overlooking the Roman camp, and they prepared for battle. Now, while the Carthaginians were the traditional masters of the sea, on land, they weren't always the brightest. And I want to stop and back up to something we talked about yesterday, because yesterday he was talking about how the Romans copied the technology for the Carthaginian ships. And somebody was pointing out to me that had done some research on this topic that the way the ships were built, they were almost like a, an assembly line type of thing, right? Where you had certain pieces that fit here. And, and so it was actually really easy to reverse engineer because of how they were built. Uh, it made it real easy to copy and mass produce those. So interesting thing, again, that we don't really have time to dive into, but might be worth looking into on your own. Case in point, <laughs> setting up in this position overlooking the Roman camp was just about the stupidest thing they could have done. Why? Well, there's something you gotta understand about Carthage. The Carthaginian land forces actually suffered from a multitude of different issues. First of all, since the Carthaginians were rich, 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 they could afford to pay a huge number of foreign mercenaries to fight for them. These mercenaries actually made up the vast majority of Carthage's forces, and therefore, Carthage's land armies were a melting pot of many different cultures. This, however, meant that if a battle wasn't going their way, there could be loyalty issues. Mm. Man, I ain't getting paid enough for this. You Balearic slingers better not be thinking of running away. What did he say? I don't know, man. I don't speak Phoenician. And this is why I often praise people the likes of Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower never really held a combat command in wartime. But what made him a brilliant general and the right guy for the time in World War II was that he was able to bring together a multinational coalition. And now, granted, a lot of them were English-speaking between the U.S., the Americans, and Canadians who made up the majority of that force. But also dealing with the French, and you had Polish, and you had other forces as well. Being able to bring all that together with competing interests and competing uh, commands and and. Uh, uh, desires and, and uh, kind of focus as far as where you want things to go and making that work, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. And multinational coalitions fail much more often than they succeed. So let's get out of here. Clearly, there were also language issues. The military generals tended to be Carthaginian 
but they made a lot of strange decisions. For example, one of the most feared assets of the Carthaginian army were the war elephants. To a Roman soldier who had never even seen an elephant before, this was like fist fighting, a literal monster. Yet the Carthaginians continually kept placing the elephants in the rear, where they were no use. In a similar fashion, the neighboring region of Numidia provided Carthage with the most skilled cavalrymen in the world. So why do they put them in the rear? Well, I don't really know for sure, but I think one of the reasons is if you have a limited resource and it's valuable, you tend to be afraid to use it. Think World War I with these massive dreadnoughts, these battleships that are built that cost a ton of money and resources and are not easily replaced. Uh, you're afraid to lose them, and so you end up not using them. And so they really become more of a deterrent than an actual effective military weapon. But the Carthaginians often chose to fight on rough, uneven terrain, where horses and elephants were less effective. And so, in this case, when the Carthaginians again chose the rough terrain near the Roman camp, the Romans easily sent them packing. Wow, Regulus. We're mere miles from Carthage. You sure are amazing. Yes, Steve. I know. Steve. <sighs> Steve? What's the matter? We've almost won. I just wish I could be as great as you, Regulus. Steve. You're amazing. I mean, look at this thing. It's the unbelievable. Butt. I know. But I mean, like, at war stuff. I'm such a noob. My tanks always get blown up. I can't even fly an aircraft straight. Here comes an ad. Tanks? Aircraft? What are you talking about, Steve? I'm talking about free-to-play online multiplayer combat game and this video's sponsor... Really good game, War, War Thunder. Thunder. Great game. Thunder. A lot of fun. War we'll Thunder watch it. is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Don't just drive the tank. Become one with the tank. I've done a lot of streams on my gaming channel, VTH Gaming. Check it out. Link in the description. Uh, with... Uh, fellow uh, viewers on War, uh, War Thunder, a lot of fun. You can be tanks, you can be planes, you can be ships. It's great. You can play as more than 2,000 battleships, aircraft, tanks, and helicopters in dynamic player versus player combat. With amazing 4K graphics, each vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components. And for history nerds like you and I, the vehicle collection in War Thunder spans over a hundred years of military development yeah, from cool. the 1920s to the present day. I love the detailed damage mechanics in War Thunder. You ever think about how the exact angle a shell hits an armored vehicle affects the resulting damage? War Thunder has. Every bullet and shell is simulated with realistic destruction. That's the kind of thing that gets me up in the morning. And by using my link in the description below, new and existing users can get an exclusive oversimplified decal to make their T-50 tank look extra spicy. Plus, you'll get a huge bonus pack, including premium vehicles and boosters. So play War Thunder now on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. And as always, by using my link, you'll be supporting my channel. So thank you. Now where were we? Oh yeah. Invading Africa, getting some booty, and sending the Carthaginians packing. Everything was looking up for Regulus. A Roman victory seemed like it was only a matter of time. But then, Regulus realized something. He had been consul for almost a year, and his term was coming to an end. Uh -oh. He knew that if his successor took over and he finished the job, then he would get the naked statues, not Regulus. So see again how military strategy takes a back seat to the politics involved. Again, this is, this is something that's happened throughout history. Look at World War II. Look at how the timing of certain invasions and the routes that were taken and, and the choices that were made were affected by things like what's the post-war world going to look like? How are we going to divide Europe between us and the, and the Soviet Union? And, you know, it went, all of that stuff plays into it. It's not just about what's the most effective way to win the war. It's about what's the most effective way to win the war by also getting what we want politically. And there was no way Regulus was going to allow that. So he jumped the gun. You there, Carthaginian boy. I want you to deliver a message to your elders. I, Marcus Attilius Regulus, demand the total and unconditional surrender of Carthage. Unconditional surrender? 
Jeez, at least lay siege and starve us all to death first. Just deliver the message, you punk! He demands your total surrender. What? Jeez, at least lay siege and starve us all to death first. Hey, that's what I said. Well, boys, this Roman thinks we're out. But we're not out, are we, boys? No! We'll do what we always do in times like this. Hire somebody else to solve our problems for us. Darren, bring in the Spartan. <laughs> Regulus's overly harsh demands had had the unintended effect of reinvigorating Carthaginian resolve. They brought in a mercenary from the famed land of Sparta. Please tell me he's going to look like Gerard Butler from 300. Please tell me that's the case. Named Xanthippus to help dig them out of this situation. And we all know what Spartans ah, are like. There we go. Yes! This is Sparta! I love it. Xanthippus showed up and immediately took charge. He had a look around and said, You idiots, put the elephants in front of the army so they can smash into the Romans and stop fighting on rough, uneven terrain. Find a big flat field so your superior cavalry can do their job. Sometimes you have to bring in the outside help to tell you what you need to hear. The Americans did this during the revolution. You know, people like uh, Baron von Steuben, who probably wasn't really who he claimed to be, but still was able to come in and say the same kinds of things that people like Washington had been saying. But it took bringing in a European, a, a German who had the gravitas and who had the aura of being somebody who really knew what he was talking about to kind of whip the colonists into shape. And what's this I hear about you giving a speech telling everyone they're gonna die? Hey, I was just telling the people the truth. You're a politician. Lie to the people. Ah. And so Xanthippus led out the newly reformed Carthaginian army to meet Regulus in the Battle of the Bagradas River. The elephants, now in the front, smashed into the Roman lines, causing disarray. The cavalry, with total freedom of movement, outflanked the Roman infantry. Thanks to this impressive Spartan, the battle was a total Carthaginian victory. I want to know who this Spartan is. We need to look a little deeper into that. So his name was Xanthippus of Carthage. He was a Greek, possibly Spartan, mercenary general hired by the Carthaginians to aid in their war against the Romans during the First Punic War. Uh, and he leads them to this victory, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it seems that he gets killed later on. So there you go. And Xanthippus, for his stunning oh, victory, there he said was it. forced to <laughs> flee Carthage it up. because the leadership got jealous. Regulus, the Roman consul, was captured during the battle. Legend has it, he was brought before the Carthaginian council, and they made a proposition. Well, Reggie, not Reggie. looking so good anymore, is it? Looks like we beat you pretty bad, huh? <laughs> Up yours, you punic pansies! Now, now, Regulus, nobody likes a sore loser, do they? No. How about this? We're gonna send you back to Rome, and you convince the Roman Senate to surrender to us. If you fail, though, you gotta come back so we can torture you to death. Okay? Okay. Sure. You promise? I promise. Pinky swear. Hey, guys. <laughs> By the way, in that battle, uh, from everything I've read, it looks like the Carthaginians lost maybe a thousand, and the Roman casualties were like over 10,000. So, interesting. Whoa, Regulus. We thought you got captured. I did, but they sent me back to convince you to surrender. Well, should we? Surrender? No, never surrender. Give them hell, boys. They're at the end of their rope. Anyway, I gotta go be tortured to death now. What? Yep, part of a deal I made. It's a long story. Whoa, hey, wait, Regulus. No, no, it's cool, guys. I promised. Regulus. This is ancient times. We massacre entire populations. We chop pets in half. You can break a promise. No, Tim. You never break a promise. That's too far. That's, so? that's too far. Children are sacrificed. We slaughter entire populations. We conquer people. But you can't break a promise. Regulus went back to Carthage and was tortured to death. So we make fun of that, but there was a unique sense of honor here. Uh, in, in things like that. And, and while certain things were understood to be part of war, there were also certain things that a man of honor would do. And it, 
it doesn't make any sense to us now, but... And for keeping his promise, he was immortalized as the leading symbol of Roman virtue. Meanwhile, after their defeat in Africa, the remaining Roman survivors, still in Africa, were still in Africa, and they needed to be rescued. So the Romans sent their fleet to pick him up and bring him home. They successfully fended off a Carthaginian fleet, grabbed the survivors, and made their way to Sicily. A great success. But then, things took a turn for the worse. Uh, sir? That cloud looks kind of angry. Fear not, coward. If we Romans can build a war fleet from scratch and defeat the Carthaginian Empire at their own game, why then even Mother Nature herself will crumble before us. I laugh in the face of Mother Nature. Ha <laughs> ha! See? Come on, guys. Laugh at Mother Nature with it's me. not gonna go <laughs> well. <laughs> the times that weather has been the deciding factor in wartime. I mean, the Spanish Armada in 1588, that was weather. It wasn't the might of the British Navy. That played a part, but it was weather. Uh, you know, the, uh, the times that Japan was going to be invaded... Uh, throughout history and weather turned back the invading fleets you know the d-day landings were delayed by a day because of weather and almost didn't happen at all if the weather had continued to be bad who knows what might have happened the weather obviously playing a huge factor with napoleon's defeat uh, because of his invasion of russia stalingrad the weather 284 ships, nearly 80% of the Roman fleet was destroyed. Wow. As many as 100,000 men drowned in a terrifying act of nature. Never before had Rome lost so many men in a single incident. And you have to think, put yourself in the mindset of that day, you're obviously going to think that if you're Carthaginian, the gods have protected us. Baal or whoever you, you know, you it is, it is that you attribute this to. The Romans, a lot of them are going to think that, you know, fate or the Ro you know, the gods were against us in this. A hundred thousand casualties for any other nation would be crippling. Any other nation would hastily sue for peace. Any other nation would spend decades trying to recover. But Rome was not just I didn't any hear other no nation. bell infamous for its unrelenting determination in the face of overwhelming odds rome said well i guess we'll just have to build another fleet and they did Jeez. in just three months they built 220 more ships wow. an astonishing feat the romans sent out their brand spanking new war fleet and they got caught really? in another storm this time, no the way they do it again. The fleet was lost, and still, the Romans did not give up. This is a big part of why Rome is going to be so successful uh, in growing their empire. And I know my friend Mr. Terry, I, I caught a couple of minutes of his uh, reaction yesterday because it was premiering, and I, I stopped in just to kind of check the chat and say hi and everything. Um, was saying something about empires, and he makes a good point, which is that. We use the term empire, uh, and we can get very literal with that and say, well, if you don't have an emperor, you're not an empire. But you can also use the word empire to talk about any large uh, political entity that conquers other peoples and has lots of different people groups and nationalities and things like that within it. And, and for Rome to grow its empire in the loosest sense, obviously when it's still a republic, it requires this kind of unrelenting attitude. Uh, in order to be able to grow and overcome and conquer. The Carthaginians couldn't believe it. Their enemy had just lost hundreds of thousands of men, had two fleets almost entirely destroyed, and they still wouldn't surrender. And if I'm the Carthaginians at this point, I'm evaluating myself and asking, do we have the intestinal fortitude to stand up to a power like that? who does not seem to know what quit means, what giving up means, what losing means. Are we willing to sacrifice the way that they have in order to win this? As one Roman poet put it, the victor is not victorious if the vanquished does not consider mm. himself so. 
In typical Roman fashion, after a short break, they were once again building another Jeez. fleet. However, for now, after all the disasters at sea, the focus began shifting back to the land campaign in Sicily. The Carthaginians, overconfident from recent successes, attempted to retake Panormus, but the Romans countered the terrifying war elephants by throwing stuff at them and scaring them away. So again, here we see the evolving of tactics to deal with new threats. So, okay, elephants weren't a big deal because they weren't using them properly. Then they started using them properly. So now we say, okay, how do we counter this threat? This is how we see technology and tactics evolving. Every war does this. Every war looks totally different at the end than it does at the beginning if it's a protracted any kind of a long war because people adjust and whoever adjusts better and makes the proper uh, changes that are needed is gonna come out on top. Having stopped the Carthaginian advance, the road was now open to the final Carthaginian stronghold on the island, Lilibium. Lilibium was an extremely well fortified city. In 250 BC, the Romans laid siege the Carthaginian defense, however, was fierce, and skilled blockade runners kept the city supplied. Progress was so slow that the siege would last another nine years. To make matters worse, the Carthaginians later sent possibly the greatest military general of the Hamble. time, a man named Hamilcar Barca, to the island. He engaged in a skillful campaign of guerrilla warfare behind enemy lines, and for the remainder of the war, he was a major thorn in the Roman side. For now, with the deadlock siege at Lilibium, and I got a little ahead of myself there. That's Hannibal's dad, not Hannibal. And the new Roman fleet at sea, things seemed to be at a standstill, and the Romans had to do something to break the deadlock. Thankfully, the Roman consul, Clodius Pulcher, had an idea. He tried to get things moving by attacking the Carthaginian fleet at Trapana. Now, before a battle, to predict if they would win, it was common for the Romans to look for signs from the gods. This could mean observing the weather or inspecting some cow livers. You know, typical religion stuff. In this case, Pulcher reportedly tried to feed some sacred chickens, but unfortunately for him, they wouldn't eat a crumb. A very bad sign. Well, he said, if they won't eat, then let them drink, stupid chickens. We'll observe the weather instead. Gods, give me a sign. Uh, ignore that. Okay, how about this? If I can get this piece of paper into that trash basket, we'll win. Okay, if I can stay. We laugh at this stuff now, but I can remember as a kid trying stuff like that, right? Like, all right, God, if you really want me to ask this girl out, I'll make this next basket. No lie, I did that. And... It seems ridiculous now, but, you know, that's how you think sometimes. And there's actually a story about that from the Bible, too. There's a, um, a story of a man who, his name was Gideon. And Gideon is has this angel appear to him and, and tells him he's a mighty warrior while he's hiding in a hole from invading armies and tells him he wants to lead this force. And Gideon's like, all right, well, if you really want me to do that, I'm going to lay this fleece out. And if I wake up tomorrow morning and the, and the fleece is wet, but the ground is dry, then I'll know. And then it happens. All right, well, if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then I'll know. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Those stories exist through many cultures. Stand here silently for five seconds and do nothing will win. <laughs> ah, dang, damn it! Pulcher chose to ignore the signs from the gods. And in the following battle... The superior Carthaginians tore them to shreds. It also didn't help that by now the Romans had removed the Corvus to stabilize their ships. And without their secret weapon, it was a disaster. And Pulcher was disgraced. To make matters worse, the victorious Carthaginian fleet then went on to intercept a Roman supply fleet on its way to Lilibium. As they approached, however, they saw the signs of an incoming storm, so they took shelter. The Romans, on the other hand, said, Onward, men! Set sail! We've got to deliver these supplies stat! How many storms do you need to destroy your ships before you figure this out? But sir, those clouds, don't you think we ought to have learned our lesson by now? Yes, Brian, we ought to have. But we haven't. <laughs> Another fleet and 50,000 men lost 
in another storm. Disaster. Now, at this point, there still really isn't a clear winner. Sure, the Romans have captured most of Sicily and cornered the Carthaginian land forces at Lilibium, but the continued disasters at sea were critically depleting their resources, and without a strong fleet, Rome could not win. Meanwhile, Hamilcar Barca was still knocking about and creating even more problems. So, where do we go from here? How does this war finally end? By now, the two sides had been fighting for 23 years. They were exhausted. Their money, their resources, their strength were all utterly spent. The Carthaginians in particular were eager to see the war end so they could get back to trading and making money. So after the latest Roman disaster at sea, they said, look, there ain't no way in heck the Romans can come back again. They can't possibly afford to build another fleet. They're done. They're That's building another it. fleet. Recall the navy, repurpose them as merchant ships, and let's get back to making some money. <laughs> Assuming the Romans would soon make peace, an anti-war faction within the government recalled a large portion of the navy, leaving Hamilcar on his own. The victors appeared to be declaring themselves victorious. Meanwhile, the vanquished were... Remember the quote from earlier that if you don't admit you've lost, you haven't lost yet, no matter what the other side says. Getting ready for round five. The Romans built another fleet, this time heavily relying on patriotic donations from the upper classes to afford it. And once again, they put to sea. Uh, sir, the Romans have built another fleet. Oh, for goodness sake, Clarence, can't you see I'm busy rolling around in this pile of money? But sir, I don't care anymore, Clarence. I just don't care. The Carthaginian politicians made a fairly lackluster final effort with a poorly built fleet to supply their forces in Sicily. But when the brand new Roman fleet caught them at the Battle of the Agates, even without their signature Corvus, they dealt them the final blow. And that was that. 23 years of war. Neither side could afford to keep fighting, but the Romans showed that they intended to anyway. The Carthaginians had no choice but to throw in the towel. The war had been long and hard for both sides, but in the end, it was Roman determination that won the fight. The Romans had spent the entire war trying to find a way to deliver the knockout blow. They learned how to build a fleet and engage in naval combat. They developed ingenious new ways of waging war. They attempted an invasion of the Carthaginian heartland, and whenever disasters struck them, they always came back again and again. The Carthaginians, on the other hand, spent the entire war watching whatever Rome did and then figuring out how to respond. They were much more passive, and so it's no wonder then that when both sides were close to collapse, Rome was the one who figured out how yep. to go that little bit further. And you know, this is a life lesson right here. I mean, this is how some people get ahead in life because some people are just willing to do more, to work harder, to give and sacrifice more than other people are willing to. And that's why I tell people all the time, just even with YouTube, you know, YouTube is not something where people see overnight success. There are exceptions to that, and it does sometimes happen. But, you know, my first YouTube channel, my gaming channel, after two years, I had 4,000 subscribers. Uh, and after another two years, I had barely hit 10,000. Uh, you know, but I understood that, and I'm not trying to build to my own horn here. I'm just saying I understood it was going to take time and a lot of work to see any success. And now, you know, we've got the growth here with vlogging through history and stuff like that. Didn't happen overnight. And a lot of people don't succeed, not because they don't have the ability, but because they just give up too quickly. In 241 BC, the Carthaginian politician sent word to Hamilcar Barca that he was on his own and could choose to make peace with the Romans if he wished. Hamilcar was stunned. He felt betrayed by the politicians. Some sources say he refused to even negotiate. Nevertheless, terms had to be drawn up. Well, Hammy, I'm glad you Carthaginians have finally come to your senses and recognized who the true winner is. How many fleets did you lose? No, 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 no. Okay, here are our terms. You leave Sicily to us and return all of our prisoners. You're not allowed to make war against Syracuse or her allies, and you have to pay us 2,200 talents of silver over the next 20 years. What's a talent of silver? 
Well, to put it in perspective, in the year 2022, that'll be worth around, let's say, 40 million US dollars. Ay caramba! That will cripple us! Wow, we got a real smart guy over here. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the point, you dingus. And we know what happens when you put crippling uh, indemnities on someone after a war. Eventually, it can come back to bite you. Ugh, I guess I have no choice. I accept. Great. Oh, by the way, we changed our minds. You actually have to pay us 3,200 talents of silver over 10 years. Thanks for accepting. Dude! See you later. Hey, hey! You didn't let me say on cool! He didn't let me say on cool. The Dude, treaty I'm was cool. extremely punishing. And by switching up the terms at the last minute, they enraged <gasps> the Carthaginians. But still, one of the longest and deadliest wars at the time was finally over. The Romans had won. They achieved their aim of gaining Sicily, and even though it wasn't part of the peace deal, they took advantage of a weakened Carthage and grabbed Corsica and yep. Sardinia as well. Roman expansion beyond the Italian peninsula had just begun. The Romans hoped that now the Carthaginians would forever be under their thumb. Unfortunately, the harsh terms they placed on the Carthaginians at the end of the war left a growing anger, one that would come back to haunt them. Who can imagine a world in which putting crippling punishment on someone at the end of a war would lead to another war with that same group of people? One day, Carthage will have its revenge. That's nice, dear. I'm serious, woman. Hannibal. Maybe not in my lifetime, but perhaps in his. My beautiful son. Linda. You are born into a momentous destiny. You shall be Rome's greatest enemy. You'll tear Rome limb from limb. You'll burn their pathetic city into the ground. You'll slaughter their people, men, women, and children. My child, you are vengeance. Stop Honorable. telling our baby he's vengeance. But he is, Barbara. He's vengeance. That may be so someday. But for now, our son has a name, and you should call him that instead. His name is... So I guess that's going to be our next oversimplified video. It sure seems that way, doesn't it? I mean, I can't imagine he's setting this up any other way. The Second Punic War coming soon. Very cool. I'm excited. In the meantime, I'm going to be studying up on this because I want to be prepared when that one comes out. I want to know a bunch of stuff about it. So I'm going to be diving down some Punic War rabbit holes in the next coming months. So I hope you enjoyed that. Please hit like. Uh, and like I said, if you would consider subscribing, checking out Patreon, things like that, I'd greatly appreciate that. Thanks for watching.